Jehiv, August Falcher of Ishtak, August Ahazar and Veh Ivor Lahar Kun on Lake Show, a Hort Dive, August Tosulagum Gominishiv, Salt Us. Um, good morning, everybody. Sorry for the, um, the frisson of, uh, of, 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 of technological difficulty here, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. And what I want to talk to you about today is the prequels, if you like, to the modern relationship between Ireland, Britain and Europe. In other words, what were the foundations for the uh, current set of relationships which we enjoy or uh, tolerate with our neighbours nearer and further away? Now, the first thing I'd like to say to you is most of this, the stuff we know as our relationship with Europe originated in the 16th century, which was a time of extraordinary change and disruption in Ireland, in Britain, and in Europe. The first thing that was happening, which completely blew the top off everything, was the New World was discovered by uh, the Spaniards initially, and then colonised, exploited by the various powers of Europe. That was an explosion from which Europe never fully recovered. The second thing that happened was, with the European exploration and exploitation of America, came to Europe a whole world of new possibilities. And the first new possibility came was capital in the form of bullion. And this precious metal tide engulfed the whole of Europe, altering the financial, economic and social relationships of people, the length and breadth of the continent, including this country. The third thing that happened, of course, was the ideological serenity and the religious sort of um, living together, which had characterized an earlier period, broke down in the Reformation and in the wars of religion which ensued. And these were extremely bitter all over Europe. We like to think of ourselves as a bit special in this regard. We're not special at all. This was a bloody conflict all over Europe. Remember, it was between Islam and Christianity in the Far East, and then over here in the West between the different Protestant denominations and the old religion, uh, Catholicism. So all that stuff is going on in the 16th century. So I call those the macro level changes. Now, at the same time, in dear little Ireland, there were what we call the micro-level changes going on, and there were three aspects to that. First of all, it was what was happening everywhere else that was happening here as well. Number two, Ireland was being integrated politically, socially, and militarily into an expanding European power called England. And that involved the military, the social and the economic reduction of Ireland. Thirdly, Ireland was also uh, enduring or suffering or going through a set of internal changes uh, between the various interested parties, between the incoming New English, between the old English who've been here since the Norman invasion, and between the native Gaelic Irish uh, nobilities and peoples. So this was the micro-level changes linked into the macro-level changes, and this produced an explosion in early modern Ireland, which produced a set of circumstances which began to meld and mould into a new relationship with Europe. Now, what were the concrete consequences of these changes? There are a million different ways of looking at what the consequences of these macro and micro changes were in Ireland. I'm going to concentrate on just one of them, for simplicity's sake. It's a good example, if I may say so, because it is focused, and I do think it is representative, and it's the following. The changes I've just mentioned at the macro and the micro level destabilised Ireland. And one of the manifestations of that destabilization was it released previously stable groups of the Irish population to move about and to move abroad. And there were three groups in particular I'm going to look at. 
And they're all, they have one thing in common, which we'll see later on. The first group was a group of Irish bishops. Now, who the hell were they? Very, very simple. With the Reformation, a new set of Anglican bishops came into Ireland as the bishops of the Church of Ireland. It took them a long time to get their feet, but it started happening in the 16th century. When new bishops come in, old bishops go out. So you have an itinerant group of Irish bishops who are released from their sees from the middle of the 16th century, and these people are mad as hell. And they're looking for redress and support. They're not going to go to England for it. That's where their displacing cousins are coming from. So these people tend to go straight to HQ, and they go straight to Rome. And this starts a traffic of what they call Rome runners, <laughs> who are over and back between Ireland and Rome, seeking redress for their situation, because nobody realizes that this is for good. Everybody believes that this is just a temporary interruption. So that's the first sort of traffic we see between Ireland and Rome, which is more frequent and um, uh, of, of greater uh, magnitude than peer to, to four. A second group are released by the changes. The second group are a group of people rather like you and me. And they are the sons of the better off sort of people. <laughs> and they are people who have money and are anxious not just to keep it, but to make more money. To do that, they need educated clerks, accountants, and people who know a thing or two about international relations, about writing, about bookkeeping, etc. The merchants of places like Limerick, and you see the little steed map of it there from the 17th century, need, the, need their sons to be educated. And they've always sent them abroad for education because there's no university in Ireland at the time. They go to England and they've always gone to Europe. In the 16th century, they start going more and more frequently to Europe. 16, 17 and 18 year old young men they go out to Europe to get an education and they pick up what's going on out in Europe. And they come back and they're not as docile or as obedient or as willing to do what daddy said as they were before they went out. So this is a second disruption, if you like, in the traditional way of doing things. A third group are also released for mobility by the events of the 16th century. And these are the Gaelic, Irish elite, the cultural elite of the Gaelic Irish. The poets, the historians, the medical scholars, the recorders and chroniclers of the histories of the Irish families. These are a crucially important group of people in traditional Irish society. With the defeat of the Gaelic Irish, especially with the Battle of Kinsale in 1603, not a million miles from here, their patrons are removed and they have no patrons now to support them. They do, some of them make a transition to become the historians of the incoming landed classes coming from England, but most of them, their services, I regret to say, are no longer required. Now, in Scotland, that very same group of Gaelic Irish elite are harnessed to the Protestant Reformation in Scotland and become one of the main reasons why the Protestant Reformation in Scotland was so successful. On the contrary, in the Irish situation, this group of people, which in Scotland becomes a great agent of the Reformation, does exactly the opposite. They go abroad, they become associated with the counter-Reformation, and rather than being a support to the state changes which are taking place in Ireland at the very same time, they become, in the longer term, a hindrance to it and an opposition to it. So we see three groups of people released into mobility, static beforehand, and now they're all over the place. Bishops, students, and the Gaelic Irish elites. Okay? So these people are moving out from cities like Limerick, and they're going to Europe. 
And I have here a map of the Irish colleges in Europe, which is an interesting iteration of these three populations coming together and forming an overseas diaspora, which has alliances and loyalties different to what they would have held if they had remained in Ireland. Now, there are three or four zones. We always think of the Irish College as if there was just one group of Irish colleges and that was that. No. Every college is different and every college has a particular complexion and a particular purpose. Cork people will be glad to hear that there was a special college for Cork people. <laughs> and nearly everybody else in Ireland would agree it was a good thing to have a special place for Cork people. Uh, not all the Cork people went to Bordeaux, but a lot of them did. And there was a man there called Donald McCarthy, obviously a Chinaman, and he founded the Irish College in Bordeaux. Who was, who was it for? It was for the sons of the Gaelic and the old English nobility of Cork and Kerry, I'm afraid too, and other counties in Munster, and please, for nobody else. Bordeaux is for our people here in, in the south, in Munster, and particularly in Cork. So that was the college in Bordeaux. The college in Salamanca, in Spain, was founded by a man called Thomas White. He came from Clonmel, which isn't a billion miles away from here, but he wasn't as fond of Cork men as McCarthy was. And he founded his college in Salamanca for the sons of the merchant elites of the Munster and the general of the Irish ports. People from Limerick, Cork, especially Waterford, Wexford, Galway, all the old ports, and to an extent from Dublin, though Dublin was much less important, relatively speaking, than it became later on. Okay. There was a third group, because Ireland is a series of small little republics rather than one country this time, and they were from where I hail from, they're from the Pale, from County Mees, County Gildare and County Dublin. And there was a man called Cusack, Thomas Cusack, 1592, and he set up a college in Dewey, in the Low Countries, it's now in France, and there he brought the sons of the Pale Old English nobility and gentry, and he set them up there in the Irish College in Dewey. And a last group I'd like to underline, just to show you how varied and different these people were, in Louvain. Remember I mentioned the Gaelic noble elites, the poets and the chroniclers? They went to Louvain, and a man called Flattery Omel Chonera who was from us common, he set up a college which had a very particular welcome for the peoples of these uh, backgrounds. And that was the Irish Franciscan College in Louvain. And I don't need to tell you, because you're an extraordinarily uh, educated group of people, that Louvain became the powerhouse, literally, for two things. One, for the modernization of Irish literature, from being a medieval activity which was quite insular to becoming an international activity which was linked to all the great literary movements in Europe at the time. And the second thing it did was it put this Gaelic elite, it harnessed it for the counter-reformation. In other words, these people said, we're for this Gaelic version of life, we are for this Gaelic literature, and we are for the counter-reformation. So they were, again, another group in Europe, very much working against what was the entrenching establishment in Ireland. So you can see, across all those colleges, a huge variety of uh, backgrounds, a huge variety of expectation, and as nearly always in Irish history is the case, a great level of confusion and conflict. The Irish who went to Europe in the 16th century and afterwards were a group of people who did not have a coherent, agreed 
identity. They went as monster men. They went as palesmen. They went as um, Ulster men. But they did not go generally as Irish men. It was only when they went out to Europe, people asked them, who are you? And they said, I'm Mickey McGowan, I'm from Bally de Hob, and nobody knew where that was at all. And maybe they still don't. And gradually, by force of being asked who they were, they had to decide who they were. And it's that process which became the core process in Ireland's relationship with Europe. And what I mean to say is a simple thing. Europe and the experience of being in Europe, particularly in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, was a core ingredient in the process by which the, this a sort of, what do you call it, a sort of a, a band of vagabonds from various backgrounds decided who they were. And they decided that they were overall Irish they decided that overall, though not exclusively, they were Catholic, and they decided overall, but not exclusively, that they weren't in complete agreement with the new arrangements which were prevailing on the island of Ireland. So there is an identification going on, absolutely crucial, and there is also an opposition growing one which will be harnessed at various moments in the Irish story as it progresses through the 17th and the 18th century. Now, I've concentrated on these three groups, the peripatetic bishops, the errant students, and the discontented but enormously talented uh, Gaelic-Irish cultural elite. And of course, they are a really important set of people who are setting the markers, and um, deciding who we are, helping us to decide who we are. They're only a minority among the thousands of Irish who went abroad during this period. A second group, and a far more numerous group, are their brothers, who weren't that interested in religion, who didn't really care much for education, and who weren't really into reading the Gaelic Chronicles or the Bardic poetry or looking at the history of the verb form in the ninth century. They were interested in making a living. Now, how do you make a living in 17th and 18th century Europe if things aren't so good at home, if you're not really that much into religion and culture and education, and... Um, Mammy and Daddy really are a bit tired of having you around the house at home. Now, if you were the son of the new English who were coming into Ireland at the time, you would have joined the British Army. And that's what families all over Ireland did, the new English families did in Ireland. They had a son who took over the estate. First come, first serve, primogeniture, remember that one from school? Eldest male gets the land, okay? Females will have to be looked after or look after themselves. The surplus sons, what are we going to do with them? Because everyone had to have insurance policies at the time, no point just having one son and leaving it there. Plague, want, war, early death. Generally, to be sure, you had to have a number of sons. So one son inherits, what do you do with all the other ones? Send them off to the army. Hopefully, they will be conveniently deceased in war for the glory of the country and the glory of their family. Let's not be too squeamish about it. But the problem for these Irish now is that with the Reformation and the confiscations, they can't join the British army. First of all, they're not allowed to bear arms because there's going to be a rebellion. And secondly, you have to be an Anglican to join the British army because you have to attend Anglican services in the barracks. What do you do? You go abroad and you sign up with the French, you sign up with the Spanish, you sign up with the Austrian armies. Some of them even signed up with the Swedish imperial armies in the 17th century. And this military population, I was talking about a scholarly population earlier on, which was perhaps in the hundreds, maybe in the thousands. 
the military population, friends, is in the thousands and the tens of thousands, particularly in the 18th century. And the system which works out is really devilishly clever and effective. Okay? You have Catholics in Ireland who still retain their land because they're very clever lawyers. All right? They have seven sons. Now, if all the sons stay at home, the estate's going to be split up between the seven sons, because that's the rule. Okay, Gavelkind, primogeniture for Church of Ireland, for the Protestants, and Gavelkind for Catholics. That's part of the, of the penal law system. All right? Now, if you're a dad, when you have an estate, and you want to keep it in the family hands, you're going to have to encourage the sons to go abroad and sign up. And where are they going to sign up? And they're going to sign up into the armies of the countries where their brothers who are bishops and students and Gaelic elites are already well established. And we see from the 16th century onwards, especially from the early 17th century in Spain and the Netherlands in the beginning, and then of course in France, particularly France in the 18th century, a very large exodus of Irish soldiers uh, military men, people like you and me very often, going out looking for a life and spending that life in the great armies of Europe. Now, military life was awful. Apart from the inconvenience of an early death, it was a boring life when there wasn't a war going on. You were paid, but the work was awful. You were fed, but the food was lousy. And unless you ascended the ranks, you didn't often get the social status that you might believe you deserved, being an O'Connor or a McCarthy or an O'Driscoll or people who were something at home. You were just a pawn abroad. So it's a population which puts up with the situation out of necessity. But the minute an opportunity to do something else arises, they will run for it, snap it up, and take advantage of it. And luckily for them, in the 18th century, things began to change in Ireland. And three things in particular began to, began to happen, which affected this group, which had been going abroad, and made them think a second time about going abroad. The first thing that happened was Ireland entered one of its short but periodic uh, phases of economic prosperity. This happened from the 1750s. It was closely associated with the textile trade and it caused nothing short of a boom in Ireland. This meant, quite simply, that people who had formerly gone abroad to fight now had alternative possibilities for employment at home first change. If I don't have to get killed in an army, I can slave in a mill instead. At least I won't die young. Change number one. Change number two, Ireland enters through economic prosperity into a much larger North Atlantic economic system. Now this has been rumbling since the explorations back in the 16th century. By the 18th century it has become a fact of life and it is introducing into Britain first and then into Ireland extraordinary possibilities in the merchant navy and of course in the British army. Now that's a bit of a problem still friends because there's still the bans in the British army regarding religion and regarding the barrier of arms, all that legislation is still there in place in Ireland. Britain needs you. It needs you for its imperial armies. It needs you to control this huge system of colonial exploitation which has been established over 200 years. What are we going to do about it? Third change happening. A liberalisation of attitudes in Britain and in Ireland and in Europe generally associated with a phenomenon we call the Enlightenment. And there are a number of practical consequences to that. And one which is 
directed specifically at these military exiles. And what is it? It is the Catholic Relief Acts of the end of the 18th century, whereby the Parliament in Dublin, with a lot of encouragement from the government in England, agrees to repeal certain parts of the penal legislation. Now, you'd want to be a saint not to think that this was at least partially self-interested. And one of the self-interested parts of it, which I think is indisputable, is that the repeal of these coercive laws, some of them, permits Catholic recruits from Ireland to join the British Army. And they start doing this just in time, you'd be glad to hear, for the slaughter of the Revolutionary Wars at the end of the 18th century, beginning in the 1790s, uh, the repeal of the first acts which have to do with religion in the army, and then into the 18th, 19th century with the Napoleonic Wars, there is plenty of room there for uh, military careers for, for the Irish. Remember, Ireland has a growing population. It has a population which is suffering from chronic under an unemployment, so the army is actually a very, very good place as a possibility for economic prosperity and some sort of status for these people who join up the British Army in very large numbers indeed. Also the British Navy, of course, and other aspects of the British imperial regime. Now, was this a completely new thing? Of course it's not a completely new thing were thousands of Irish Protestants working in the army. Of course they knew their Catholic neighbours. Of course there was a network which was already there. Secondly, these Irish Catholic exiles had been working in imperial infrastructures in Spain and in France and in the empire for hundreds of years. So they had a great deal of experience. And thirdly, and I think this is important to remember, the Irish, and we are wonderful whiners, about our situation. But there were some good sides to it. And one of the good sides was that when the Irish were in France, they were Catholic and anti-English. When the Irish were in Spain, they were Catholic, anti-English, and anti-French. And when the Irish were in Austria, they were anti-French, anti-Spanish, and anti-English as required. When they went and joined up for Britain and for the Empire, they were very good at being pro-British, pro-Empire. And let me tell you, and it's no secret, when we got at it, we could be as oppressive and as slave-owning and as nasty as any imperialist can be as any imperialist is required to be. And when you go to Nantes and visit the Museum of Slavery and you see some of the Walshes from Waterford, very, very prominent slave merchants, not just slave owners now, but slave merchants, and you go down to the O'Crowleys, if I may speak of a good Cork family, in Cadiz, there's a wonderful portrait of the, of the O'Crowley family from the end of the 18th century, and Mr. O'Crowley is there, and Mrs. O'Crowley, and all the little O'Crowleys are an absolutely gorgeous family, and they're doing very, very well indeed. And there in the corner is a little black boy, and he's got a little chain around his neck, a gold chain, very, very nicely worked, very nicely done, and O'Crowley written around his neck. So we could do it just as good as the others. And in that, from that point of view, we were very good Europeans indeed. Um, but just as European as anybody else, and nothing really special about us, except I would say, and we're really, really good at it, is playing the roles required of us as the circumstances demand. And if there is a role which we played really, really well, it was that role of people from the margins, and we are a little bit on the margins here in Ireland, when obliged to go to the centre, could adopt roles and identities which helped us compensate for our, for our marginality by making our lives and by making our ways in Europe. So at the, at the end of the 18th century, we are coming out of one age 
and we're coming into another age, the, the modern age, for our relationship here. What do I mean by that? Up until the end of the 18th century, the system which had been laid down at the end of the 16th, remember our bishops, our students, and our regalic elite, that system of going abroad, let's face it, whining a lot, and siding with the French and the Spanish and the Austrians against England, that worked really, really well. By the end of our period, a change has occurred. And we have learned and we have been permitted to join the huge British American intercontinental imperial system. As soldiers, of course, we always did that very, very well. Also as administrators, which we're fairly good at when we put our minds to it. Also as clerics, because remember, the British Empire, as it grows, takes in people of all religions. And in 1774, you know from your general history, something really important happened. Canada became part of the British Empire with the defeat of the French. And in Canada, you had a very large Catholic population. And in 1774, the British Parliament, Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which permitted Quebecois Catholics to participate in political life without giving up their religion. And that model from the empire was taken and applied here in Ireland, whereby Catholics could serve the British Empire without having to give up their the Catholic religion. All right. So this brings the Irish into a religious context as well, because the Irish, as well as being soldiers, as well as being administrators, as well as being doctors, now become chaplains as well to the various great Catholic populations in the great British Empire. And I needn't tell you that the Irish missionary outflow, the great heyday of the Irish missionary um, of Irish missionary history coincides almost exactly with the entry of Ireland fully and the Irish population fully into the what I call the British imperial system. Not exclusively, none of these things are exclusive of course, but it is the one which is nearest to hand and the one in which we have a very definite advantage. And if you go across to America, I'm coming to a close now, if you go across to America where the French Catholics were very well established from the 17th century even, and certainly into the 18th, the Irish begin to arrive in the 19th century. And it is war between the Irish and the French for control of the Catholic system in Canada, for instance, and in uh, and, and, and in North America, generally, especially in the US of A. And it is an absolute rule that the Irish coming in, in order to push the French back, make a bit of space, a lot of space for themselves, play on two things. Number one, because we speak English, we are better citizens then, than you are. And B, because we are associated with the dominant power, we are the ones who should be in charge of this part of the British Empire. So I don't want to sound too negative about it, but we do view ourselves, especially when we look at the Irish abroad, through green tinted windows and we can think, you know, we're a bit special. We are. We are a little bit special, there's no doubt about that. But we're special in different ways to the ways we usually think if I may hazard a conclusion. So to conclude, to conclude, okay, I, I, I'm landing now. Um, I knew someone used to talk about someone trying to finish a talk and he used to compare them to a crow trying to land on a telegraph pole on a windy day. So to come in and blow enough. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like that myself, but I want to finish up um, as, as, as follows. So con to conclude, the imperial entangle entanglements that I've 
try to recount to you here, enliven, I hope, and diversify our picture of early Irish modern migration. And I think they also question some of our assumptions about that migration. We've noticed, first of all, how the push of exile and the pull of wanderlust have been difficult to disentangle. Sometimes people just want to get out of Ireland. It isn't that they're being pushed out. We find ourselves suspecting also that the ingenuity or the opportunism on display, and some of the individuals I've mentioned today, can't always be explained by domestic oppression or lack of opportunity. More generally, our innocent and perhaps not so innocent ethnocentrism paints the migrant Irish in the bright greens of the moral high ground may not be as easily justified as we always believed it was. Sometimes doing good works got mixed up with turning people into goods. And fleeing oppression at home could mean imposing impression, oppression abroad. And where in this account are the women? I haven't mentioned a single female person since I started. That's true. I noticed. I'm mea culpa. And I mean, so, and uh, what I'm going to do now is the tokenism of this last slide. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm serious about this because it is, it's a, it's a self-questioning as well as, as well as a statement. But the tokenism of this la last slide only highlights the gender partiality of the foregoing account. There is the possibility that this might not be entirely a function of archival survival or selectivity. I suppose only much closer attention to the unnarrated lives that intersected with the half-narrated lives of the Irish males I've been talking about, to speak only of this instance, will help deliver in the longer term a more adequate historical account of these early modern Europeans on the move. And the woman... I have here, it, it's, this is a hugely rare portrait, which I came across completely by accident. I was in, um, in the Canary Islands, not on holidays. I was um, working in the archives in, 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 in Tenerife. There's a, a fantastic archive of a family called Walsh, the largest merchant archive in Europe. The largest merchant archive for the 18th century in Europe. It's an Irish one, just happens to be Irish. It's in Tenerife. I was out having a look at that. During my rare spare moments, I wandered around uh, Tenerife, um, Santa, Santa Cruz, and it's full of old religious houses. Most of them are now closed down, but some of them with very interesting museums. So I've walking around the museum, I think it was the Carmelites, um, no, the, the Dominican nuns, and I was walking around and I saw, I was looking at these portraits, and I saw um, well, I saw this word Russell first, and I said, God, that doesn't sound too Chinese to me. I wonder where they're from. And I went up and looked at it, and this is actually Catalina Lorenza de Jesus, Russell, and Prendergast. Okay? And she was in Tenerife, 1731 to 84, and this is painted in 1750. And what is it? It's a picture of her the day she entered the Dominican convent. The day she entered. And it was a it's a sort of a type of portrait which was taken of young women, generally of noble background, who are entering religious life. And you can see she's in the accoutrements of her, of her lay status, of her family status. So she's some jewellery and, um, I mean, I'm not really a fashion expert, but I don't think, you know, I think that would probably pass muster with the aficionados of, of the late 18th century. But this is a visible emergence, if you like, in portraiture of a completely hidden population. She's only one of hundreds of Irish women who joined uh, religious orders abroad from the 16th century. I was talking about the bishops and I was talking about the students and I was talking about the, 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 the uh, Gaelic elite, but very often they're accompanied by their, well, not with the bishops, you hope not with their wives, but, <laughs> but with... I mean, they, they go as human beings with families, and of course they are going with, uh, with, 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 with other people, of the other sex even. And, uh, but they're so, it's so difficult for us, trained as we are, to see one thing, to begin to see other things as well. And it's a, it is a tokenism, I'm first to admit it, but uh, be patient, it's a start. And uh, I hope that as we delve 
deeper into this extraordinary richness of the Irish in Europe, and I've only scratched the surface, um, that we're going to excavate far more representatively the extraordinary diversity of this population and that we're going to be open in particular to the questions they are obliging us to ask about who we are, what's important to us and, if I may enter a plea, how crucial Europe has been from the very beginning in helping us to be not only who we are, but to be even better versions of who we think we are. Goramila Mahagov. Well, I mean, I have to say.